Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, the second day of the uh, the Ethical Gem Fair, uh, the June the June edition, I guess, of the Ethical Gem Fair. Uh, my name's Ian Bone, and um, I'm speaking to uh, Haywan here this morning. We're going to have a conversation about um, comparing and contrasting the uh, the methods, I suppose, of sourcing gemstones from our respective countries. Uh, in my case, uh, from Australia, and particularly from central Queensland in Australia, uh, and in Haywan's case, from Ethiopia. So basically, it'll be a question and answer uh, circumstance, and and we'll be uh, we'll be just discussing a very broad topic about, I guess, uh, this con uh, this this concept of of sourcing stones from uh, from various countries, and and we've chosen, I guess, Australia and Ethiopia to some extent because there is a relative significant uh, variation, I suspect, in terms of the way we go about our businesses, and uh, we just hope that the outcome of this will be. Uh, to give um, people more insights into the way we do our business and how we source our product and I guess even the people and the stories we uh, we hear. So, Haywan, look, I suppose to start off with, you might like to give us a bit of a, a broad outline uh, and then if you wish, uh, you know, come down and focus in a little bit narrower on, on how you go about um, sourcing your gemstones uh, in, in Ethiopia. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome and thank you for being here and listening or watching uh, from anywhere you are. Uh, my name is Haywan Zaudi and I'm the owner of Hagari Treasures. I source gemstones from Ethiopia. Uh, originally, I am from there, but uh, I have not grown up in the mine or <laughs> really working on the sites, but I end up in becoming, you know, a gem supplier. Uh, for for many different reasons, I have covered some of it in the in the past discussion. So we're today we're gonna be uh, talking with Ian um, how we source gemstones from different countries, from pretty much from Ethiopia and from Australia, from where both of us, you know, he he sourced from Australia, Queensland, uh, Central Queensland, and where I source from Ethiopia from different regions. Uh, variation, different kind of e Ethiopian gemstones, which are currently discovered not too long ago. Uh, compared to Australia, I think they're the most experienced. <laughs> and and then we have really, I have noticed we have similar minerals as well. Mm -hmm. Like they are the, you know, the queen and the king of opals. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now uh, Ethiopia becoming another source. So, I mean, we have a lot we're going to be discussing, I think, with Ian. Uh, I have noticed we have similar, uh, I mean, mm, w like landscape or I, geographically, I guess, when it comes to mining and minerals resources are, we have really similar, a lot of, like, sa some kind of sapphires. We have opals, uh, chrysoprase, and where, the, you know, Capricorn gem, I have seen some of his stuff. And so basically we're gonna be talking about how we're sourcing from the mining community and from the, I don't mine myself. I think Ian visited a lot of mine sites as far as I've seen his videos. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll begin with like um, briefly how I source my gemstones from Ethiopia, how the mining are. So Ethiopians, we just, currently discovered um, 10 years ago, the Opal mine and in the northern region of Ethiopia, where there are a lot of mountain, uh, the well of Opal is where it's been discovered. And it's been mined by uh, small artisanal miners from the community and uh, where they've been arranged by association by the government as a mining associations miners then they have the first hand to mine the gemstones from the community than any than any outsider so the, how we get our minerals is in different region is the same way even if you go to the southern part of ethiopia where emerald and sapphire and tourmaline are mined and also i mean set up as an associations so we're like i am from the city where i grown up but i'm having an export 
uh, but I have a family member who are related to other minerals who are tantalum and emeralds. They come in tourmaline in the same kind of areas. Uh, so we source our minerals from direct from the miners. Uh, and then like there is a uh, regulations, it works. You, you, you cannot just go mine. You buy from the miners who are from the landowners. You can partner with them at a 40, 60 um, mining to, you know, per, per their permission for regional regulations only. And otherwise, uh, sourcing mine is not available in Ethiopia. Just anybody can go mine. And the other thing is we source directly and we, com we communicate with the community uh, in the mining sites. Uh, there is a, a chain, like a partner, like a chain flow where from miners and then there is a middle people who are also licensed to the exporters. So the way I get my material is direct from the sites where I communicate with the co mining community. That's the, I chose to do that in recent years, in the past five years. When I began, I used to just buy from Ethiopian gemstone exporters as it, it came, you know, discovered in 2000. Um, I think 2009, the Opals, they used to come to Denver shows and Arizona. That's when I, I actually, I begin to start to buy and get into the business, like trying to see, you know, Opal was sold really cheap in the jump show. That's what's really drew me into, to get into the business, the gemstone business, you know, to support them and to see I you know material being devaluated. And as being a gemologist, I know how really hard these materials are sourced. And I know from the history of the Australian opal, how opals are precious, you know, in the market. I mean, I work on the retail. I, I see the material, how really precious are. And that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to get engaged into the mining community, involve with them, educate them, like, you know, um, how valuable the items are. We shouldn't be thrown away, you know, like at devaluating market, devaluating our own market. That's when I start to like, start to try to find uh, miners community. I work with some Ethiopian opal miners from the different region. We have also the chocolate opal with volcanic and the nodules coming to the central, which is the first, first discovery in the late 90s, I guess. I used to work with those miners where I got connection directly when they came here. And the rest was through a family member. So I started to like, well, I'm gonna start to source direct from them create, you know, a fair trade. And I mean, to value the material number one and educate. So for me, it has been that way. And I will ask Ian, how is in Australia, the sourcing definitely is different than, you know, where we're in a baby stage and they're the more experience and advance on the mining. So Ian, you can tell me something about how do you source your materials in Australia? Uh, thanks, Haywan. Um, just listening to you, um, um, there are undoubtedly uh, uh, some common features in terms of how we go about our business, and, and of course there are some contrasting features as well. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, a little bit later. Uh, but firstly, what I'd like to do is, is to explain um, how, how I guess, the, the sourcing processes for us um, um, uh, are undertaken and in a, in a bigger sort of macro picture in terms of how we compare or how we are similar to many other uh, Western countries, I suppose, in terms of the way that the business is done, um, similar to, you know, mining operations in Montana with the Montana and Sapphire, similar to uh, to, to other uh, places around the world. Most of the, most of the, the gemstone mining uh, that is undertaken is in our case, is undertaken by small fa or fa uh, family type operations and or partnerships of one or two or three fellows together, getting together and setting up a small business. Um, it's not it's not an individual going out necessarily, and 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 although it does happen from time to time, but mostly it's small little partnerships or small businesses. From time to time, we see larger corporations. Um, and companies, you know, go into the, the gemstone mining. But what tends to happen there, or the, the history of this tends to happen, is that 
um, because of the unpredictability of mining gemstones, generally speaking, major corporations have a lot of difficulty in maintaining uh, their profitability. Uh, they can't necessarily control their costs. There are security issues. There are a whole range of problems that the small scale miners don't have. The small scale being in our case, as I said, the partnership type mining operations, the uh, the uh, the family mining operations. And, and the other thing is, of course, is variability in pricing of gemstones is over time, it varies considerably. And, and in that case, small small businesses or small partnerships can can really uh, quickly reduce their costs uh, of mining and basically shut down if the market isn't suitable for them and or start up if the market is very suitable for them whereas major corporations big companies have a lot of trouble in in controlling their costs and actually managing that process so we tend to find over time that merely by exception most of the the our mining uh, our mining uh, contacts and people are, are s small operators, one or two guys, or a family operation that's been in the business for twenty or thirty years and carried through in the generation from generation to, to generation. So it's it's really quite interesting the model that exists um, and and actually getting into the mining the gemstone mining business in Aus in Australia is is is. Is a challenge because people don't necessarily know how to do it uh, and it's generally it's by connections there will be a family connection somewhere or there will be a uh, a friendship or a mateship and someone will say hey you know we're going to go and try some of this mining would you like to be a partner in in our small mining operations and that's really how it, how it starts mm -hmm. a little bit about the history um you were saying it only recently you know the gemstones have, have really been discovered in Ethiopia. Well, in our case, you know, gemstones were discovered back in the late 1800s when Australia was being settled. Um, our sapphire fields date right back to um, the late 1800s, 1870, 1880. And in fact, the, the opal fields uh, also go way back. And those original gemstones were mined by uh, opal miners and, and sapphire miners living out in these really really harsh conditions horses and buggies and you know it was really really rough conditions um pick and shovel work um very remote um you know one one particular fellow um you know had a horse and, and mule and used to go up around the the, the western parts of queensland and and and, and, and um, uh, New South Wales and it took him six months to sort of travel around all the fields and meet with the miners and then he went back down to uh, uh, Adelaide and took a steamship over to London and took his gems. Took that was the first opals that actually came out of Australia. He he took it took him six weeks to go from the steamship from Adelaide up to London and to Hatton Garden, still there today. Um, and they showed these beautiful Australian opals. No one had ever seen them before. This was in the late eighteen hundreds. So. This, this the mining of, of gemstones in, in Australia, and particularly in western parts of Queensland, New South Wales and uh, South Australia with opal, has been in, in place for uh, over 100 years. Sapphires, similarly so. Um, again, similar type operation, remote area, uh, it's mainly, um, you know, pioneer type people going out and discovering the sapphire that exists and, and then finding markets for them, traveling overseas and bringing, bringing the, and particularly to the UK, of course, because Australia was basically settled by UK, UK uh, immigrants at the time uh, and, and making their way over to the UK. And a lot of Australian sapphires way back in the 19, in fact, Australia was the biggest sapphire producer in the 1920s, 1930s, and particularly our part of the world, central Queensland. A lot of those sapphires went to um, went to Europe and ended up all across the European royal families and the like. So it's it's a really interesting history in its own right. I mean, the whole gemstone mining history in Australia is a whole other story. But I just wanted to sort of lay a bit of foundation here for how that all works. In our specific case, I work with a business partner and this fellow's name's called Rodney Beatty. Rod's been in the business for 20 or 30 years across the whole gemstone uh, industry. He knows 
hundreds of people. He knows the miners personally. He did mine personally. He was part of a mining operation. He still has those contacts. He's in his 70s. Uh, and really, that's the, the key to our business is, is him working with the people that he's met over the many, nearly 45 years that he's been involved in the business. And I think this sort of goes back to some of the conversation that you were saying. It's actually the personal contacts that really make the difference. It's the personal contacts and it's the trust. It's the trust that's been established over many years that actually uh, uh, facilitates, if you like, the opportunity for us to source gemstones from these people because they know that we're not going to we're not going to um, uh, compromise, I suppose, them. We're going to pay them a fair price. We're going to pay them a reasonable price. We're going to take their gemstones and we're going to produce them. And we're actually going to show them what we do with their gemstones as well. So it's really important to us to actually have that, that relationship and that also that feedback back to the miner in our case. And they never, ever necessarily got that feedback as to seeing the beautiful pieces of jewellery that were made from their gemstones. So it's a really important thing to build, to have this trust to start with, but also to continue to build this trust. So, hey, one, I've rabbited on here for quite a while. So how about you tell us a little bit about the maybe talk about this situation of developing relationships and, and, and trust and the like. Sure. So based on what I heard from you is there is some similarity and common things in the mining community and like uh, operation wise, like this usually is operated by small scale miners and they're able, you know, like the, I have noticed in, even in Ethiopia, there is um, now when we just discovered the Emerald, uh, big companies came in and it's not profitable and it's not predictable, like you said, you know, and it's very costly. So the only big mining operation I've seen in Ethiopia is like tantalum and gold has been buying by the big companies. You know, it's, they can predict the profitability um, and they can invest into it. But the color gemstones are really sometimes tricky. You know, they find a pit somewhere else and then they will be digging the community for a few days or for a few months and then it will no longer the vein or the source available and they have to move to another site where usually they're the community and the miners community where they know and they like like you say people will go oh let's go this this site there is something or somebody will discover something a mineral and then they will start to dig around so in that terms uh, i noticed that's a very similar thing going on in ethiopia even currently except the opa mine where is a huge deposit being known and it's already you know uh guaranteed there is a resource available there's where most of the miners are like eight thousand people are just digging out on a big mountain around you know in the vine uh, other than that for other minerals like tourmaline sapphire and emeralds and the other gemstones are usually operated by you know the small communities and they move from one place to another place and they usually have like uh you get a connection from, you know, uh, like family uh, or friend. And like, that's when they will start. Some people, they even give up, you know, they will get small gemstones, colored gemstones, and then they are not gonna be digging around, but some people sticking around, looking, searching for, and they still have, you know, if like uh, in our case, like in the Emerald, we have, you know, so far now for three years, we've been working with one supplier, suppliers, we're working with the family related, connected to the site where they know the area, they can produce certain amounts. Now the past two years, almost two years now, it has not been producing as much in the Emerald site. So they only have like a certain areas where they kept, you know, they trust us, like, you know, we show them, this is what we do with the Emerald, you know, we cut them, this is what we sell. And in that case, we have, I have kept a connection and a relationship I'm building, you know, some still new into the business as well, you know, and some of the minerals are new and where the same site area we're finding beautiful tourmalines. Now that's when trying to build up the relationship and, you know, some people, they just, you know, they sell it. Uh, another t uh, problem is mostly we have seen is um, the community when they're not paid fair, or they think it's not worthless, they stop mining, you know? Mm -hmm. 
So that's what I'm thinking now. I just been discouraging like um, finding the minerals like we just discovered uh, what it called blue calcedony. And I'm like, they say, oh, this stuff is sales cheap. You know, we don't want to be wasting our time digging on this. No, it's not. This is a good material we have, you know, this we can we can buy from you guys and we can show you like I pretty much show them uh, with by local cutters what that stone in turns to by cutting cabochons, you know, to show them what what really comes out of that. They think that's not a precious stone or it's not something it can turn into jewelry. So building that's we're working is building the relationship with the miners to build trust you know yes. we can buy them as something as worth it worth working for you know uh, sourcing pretty much encouragement because paying them really low and buying them really low but that's mostly um discouraging them to mine even you know like we have uh terminated quartz Mm. And a green tourmaline, a black tourmaline. They they call it the ugly stone. Actually, I'm I'm like what? <laughs> and they're like, I met these miners who are like, they had plenty of it, and they don't want to mine about that. You know, they don't want to mine that gemstones. And I'm like, no, this this stone. Literally, I have to show them visually and a picture what it turned out to become. You know, and if something is valuable. They can you know uh, depend on it as part of their resources and incomes. And and um, I, I've been talking to them and telling them, I can buy you guys, you know, we can go ahead and dig out. It doesn't have that much of risk. You know, they said, oh, it's abundant. We have this, but nobody's buying us. Even if we are selling it, the people they're buying us is very cheap. So it's not worth our time, you know? So they want to dig uh, sapphire and uh, emerald or opal is like, the most, the fastest moving in Ethiopia currently. So that's what they think is the only valuable material. So sometimes it's a lack of education as well, you know, teaching, not knowing what, what it is. And most miners, they don't have the access to come to the city. So they usually send, you know, um, their, the brokers have licensed by the government to move material from, from, you know, from the mining to the city. So those two are only, and then the brokers are the one, you know, like uh, nowadays they're like the messenger, you know, they come to the city, there is maybe a foreign buyers in the country or the exporters. That's when they're like, oh, we buy this material, we don't buy this, we don't dig this, you know. So there is some issues still and a lack of knowledge where the minor community, they don't know what is for them profitable to dig out or what is not. So we're trying to build up a relationship, like you said, is very important. I trust, you know, some community you can trust and they can trust you. You're gonna be buying them their material, you're gonna pay them something. So in Ethiopia, it's been like a quite a challenge still educating the people about, you know, they just see if it's not something shining, like compare, compare like um, Sapphire versus Opal they think opal is the most precious because of the beauty they see the color play and that's how they value too you know and they think that's that's and the fastest selling things for them they think oh that's more precious and we don't want to waste our time digging the uh, sapphire you know mm -hmm. like we have certain sapphire in the south of southern area they don't area they don't want to even dig about it. like we have some of it we like they don't want to we're encouraging them to go ahead and start mining those materials uh telling them this is it has a market I don't give up on it you know so uh, some of them is because of lack of the knowledge of the gemstone or the buyers or cheap uh, purchase they have been like you know stop digging and get discouraged and move to different sites where and it's not available for everybody to go to the region from one region to one region. First priority is the land is given mostly for the people who are in the region. You know, it's not you cannot just move from one area and just say, oh, I'm going to go dig here. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. So this has been that way in Ethiopia. And I mean, um, other than that, what I will ask you is uh, how do you guys like processing uh, after the gemstones are mined, you know, is it's like mostly locally been cut? 
or, or do you export majority is our, as a rough material? It's, I think it's a different subject, but just, just want to know what happens after, what do they do the mining community, just selling individually as a, a rough materials to exporters or is mostly processed in the country? It de to answer that question, Haywan, it depends on the particular gem. Uh, in our case, we we handle four gems only, so we're not we're not across a, a broad range of gems. The, our business is based on the gems that that are situated in Central Queensland: sapphire, boulder opal, chrysoprase, and zircon. Only four gemstones. For the most uh, processing of of our gemstones is done by my business partner Rod. Uh, he will cut all the opal, pretty much all the chrysoprase, and he preforms all the sapphire and zircon. Now, excuse me, the reason why we preform those gemstones, there are a number of reasons. One is to get the best yield out of the stone. I mean, he's a master cutter. He's been cutting for 40, 35 years as well. So, you know, he's got a, a great capability. Uh, I mean, I cut as well, but that's not my role. My role is marketing promotion and getting out to the wide world, selling the product, marketing, talking about the product, doing this thing uh, today. Um, but what Rod will do is preform the sapphire, preform the zircon to make sure that the best possible color, the best possible yield results in that stone. So he does that in his workshop in the back of his house. I mean, he spends hours and hours, and you can well imagine, he's, it's his job basically to, to do this. But he also uh, has some great contacts in Thailand. And, and in fact, he used to live up pre-COVID, he was living in Thailand six months of the year. And, you know, Thailand to Australia is a, a few hours flight, it's no big deal. So he has other business up in Thailand, but he'd also been involved in the gemstone industry in Thailand over many years as well. So, you know, he's a wealth of information, wealth of knowledge. And of course, he's made contacts with uh, with people in Thailand that do our cutting under our supervision and to our expectation in terms of cutting uh, our goods uh, in Thailand the way we want them cut because not always you can get that done. Um, we, we have specifications in terms of cutting and of course in terms of traceability to ensure that the gem that arrives there is actually cut in the way we want it and returned in the same manner. So. That's a bit of an, 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 an ex explanation, I suppose, in terms of the cutting processes of the processing of, of our particular four gemstones. Most of it's done in Australia. Most of the uh, uh, sapphire is preformed, uh, bar all the small calibrated, uh, and then forwarded to Thailand. We have a chap in Thailand who supervises our cutting at our partner's factory there and has returned back to Australia, and that's when I pick up the material. So that's really basically a, a real brief snapshot of that. Um, I see time is sort of progressing on. Um, perhaps you can give us a short uh, outline of similarly in your case, I suppose, from a cutting point of view, processing uh, what happens in Ethiopia. Well, in Ethiopia, uh, the cutting process is still on a small scale. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean, basically, it's been done uh, only like cabochons, preformed cabochons, mostly been done for opals, and like some other materials like, you know, um, agates, amber. We have as well, and those some uh, amazonite. You know, where the institution, the cutting institution, usually let the people. They don't let them learn with opals, so they, you know, other materials they learn. There is the education for it being set up by Ethiopian government to encourage lapidary in the country, mm. but it has not been working as much. And the people don't have, they get trained and they don't have a job. And mostly the opals goes out and the majority is, uh, most Ethiopian gemstones goes out as a rough material. Also, so very few lapidaries now uh, they're cutting opal locally and because of the reason being as the government have restricted to to reduce the flow of opal and to create lapidary job and not taking 100% of rough opal you have to do like 40 60 mm -hmm. cuts like even if it's not the shape you want it or the calibrated 
somehow it has to be cut, you know. So I take some of my material. Currently, we found a woman association lapidarist, mm -hmm. and they're not really that skillful, but they know how to cut somehow, you know, taking out all the dust, the pits, and I mean, the the cavities and stuff to make like the opal really look nice. Maybe they don't have a good finishing, but then we found another lapidarist who's really becoming, been cutting in the past three, four years. He's, uh, he been recutting what they cut, you know, and reforming, the, trying to like the form, because I don't want to be sending all that stone to Thailand or Sri Lanka and trying to encourage the local lapidarist as well, but we get some of it cut locally by those women and um, some other lapidarist who is willing to train the woman for me, actually. I'm trying to set up for the opal since the government enforcing in a few years down the road, we probably we're not going to be able to take craft opals out of Ethiopia. So we're encouraging the lapidary to be cut, but the, I mean, to expand the lapidary locally even if it's not perfect, you know, we don't have that equipment and like uh, finishing, like, you know, materials to make it shine, like, you know, cerium oxide or something. They don't use even those things there. They just doing it through water. And the other material, usually how I get it cut is like, it's been a challenge for me finding cutting. Faceting is not literally available in Ethiopia for, you know, to people still learning you know still learning some people who has passion and they just learning online through youtube uh we have another major challenges and in internet down there so people they cannot even take online classes you know and payment method as well has been a challenge so what i did in the past is i have got my some of my stones you know we had ethiopian zircon as well and tourmaline and some emerald we get a cut through some American companies, one in Thailand, one in Sri Lanka, we use in the past for cutting uh, faceting stones, you know, like faceting opals as well. But currently I'm working with, uh, I mean, 19 stores, 1948 is one of our group who are having a cutting house in Sri Lanka. So we're helping each other. He's helping me on the cutting side. They've been cutting some of our emeralds, you know, to be like collaborated. Yeah. And uh, the other stuff is, is pretty much not been cutting. We're still looking for a good cutting house, which we're going to be using, I think, more likely working with them until we establish, you know. It's going to take quite a long time to get a faceting, um, you know, running in Ethiopia. So that's how it's been our sourcing in the cutting side. Um, good, briefly. good, good. Well, look, I think that's given uh, given given uh, people a, a, a great under a greater understanding, uh, hey, one of, of of what happened, what's happening over there, and of course the challenges you face, but also the opportunities. I think going forward in the years to come, um, within within the gemstone industry, there both both in the in the production and, and the cutting, and and I think there's a there's a lot of room to move there, and no doubt you're very busy in that space. Um, we're in a different situation. Um, it's much more mature. It's much more developed. And we understand that. Um, and, you know, I think part of our group of, of Ethical Gem Suppliers is a network of, of people with similar views and interests in lots of ways, but also is a resource for each of us and all of us to uh, to use and for us to, uh, to, to find out, you know, information from each other about what we're doing so we can help wherever we possibly can look i see the time is uh is, is beating us here um, yes. so we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to wrap this up but you know what i think we're going to come back again and unpack this even further at another show um you know we never conclude our conversations they just keep going on and on and on there's always more to talk about because we can always drill down further and talk about people, and we can talk about individuals, we can talk about particular circumstances, tell stories, show videos. You know, we've got a lot. We've got a lot we can offer. Um, and part of our role, of course, is educating the broader designer maker community uh, that we, our customers, um, and so they can then tell their clients, the the actual consumer, much more about what the particularities are of the material that we bring to the market. So we think it's a great thing. Uh, our relationships 
both up and down are really important to us. And we just wanted to uh, explore that here today through this whole concept of sourcing stones, both in Ethiopia and in Australia. So anyway, without further ado, um, please go over to the tables. Please come and uh, have a chat to us. We're here uh, for the duration uh, and uh, more than welcome to, uh, to talk to us about anything that, that's on your mind. Thanks very much. Thank you. Come see us at the table.